Well, thank you for staying with us. In case you just joined us, good morning to you. Time now for the news review on the AM show. We have our usual stack of papers and we'll be getting right through them. We'll be joined by Oliver Baka Vomawa, uh, as we usually do on a Tuesday morning, as we delve into topical matters. Uh, and I can see Oliver already. Uh, Oliver, good morning. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Oliver? Hello. Can you hear me from this side, Oliver? If you oh, can. Yes, there you, there you go. I can hear you now. Great, great, great. It's always a pleasure to have you join us. And, a pleasure, uh, pleasure. We'll be getting into the papers, but um, maybe right before we do, Oliver, let's take a look at some matters that have really got me thinking in recent times. The first one has to do with uh, something right down your alley, uh, Oliver. It has to do with the law and its practice in uh, Ghana. I'm sure you may have chanced upon this uh, piece about uh, judges and how they dress and all of that in, in Ghana. And recently, what the Chief Justice has been saying in that respect, not just judges, but in the past, you know, lawyers as well. So let me just quote what the Chief Justice um, says, and uh, maybe you can react to that. So he concludes on, on the, the matter of uh, dressing for judges. I reiterate that dressing in this manner, that is with all the frills, uh, helps to preserve the decorum, seriousness, and formality of court proceedings and the importance of the proper administration of justice. And the importance of the proper administration of justice. Hold it. He goes on to say, for this reason, Judges and professional magistrates should also ensure that members of the bar who appear before the courts strictly comply with the dress standards to maintain the dignity of the court. I trust that I can count on your unalloyed cooperation. So I ask you, Oliver, uh, mere vestiges of colonialism that we are clinging to, or is this indeed um, uh, something we cannot do without, a sine qua non when it comes to the dispensation of justice? Your quick take. Uh, first of all, let me just give this caveat. In former in for, in for times, I have been very unrestrained <laughs> in my comments on the Ghanaian judiciary and their, you know, observance of what you call colonial etiquette. But it, it goes beyond just some being more to colonial etiquette in a sense. Mm. It's, 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 a, it's a, how do you call it? A rehearsed practice of how do we make the law inaccessible? How do we make it strange to the populace of Ghanaians and rather than, you know, remove all these vestiges and all these te technical appearances that makes the law friendly and people, you know, can find a place of, of comfort in making the law more accessible. Mm. But I'm giving this caveat particularly because I'm, I'm, I'm in front of the Chief Justice in, with regard to the petition uh, for the removal of the Electoral Commission. In, in, and in, 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 other words, where, Oliver, in other words, Oliver, you are merely telling me that Charlie, where your finger is no. right now, you don't you don't want it to get bitten, so you're going to listen. Uh, in, in, your in words, that there's a you critique know of the system. In that there's a critique of the system. Right. In that, if if an advocate pursuing a matter as important to national interest as this right. has a certain fear of the judicial repercussions of speaking truth, truth to power. Mm. That should tell you about the state of our democracy. So in other but words, Oliver, you, you are afraid. afraid. You are basically saying yes. that our system yes. is so, I, so to yes. speak, vindictive that you are actually afraid yes. that if you say something, you'll get Absolutely written. correct. I am okay. absolutely afraid of the repercussions that would happen uh, in, in a matter like this and that people's egos and whatever or not will be placed above the national interest in this matter. Mm. But I am disappointed in every regard right. that the law, we are not making the law much more accessible, that we are not even... Con concerned about the extent to which there's inequities in our judicial administration, that mm. the law is not friendly to everyday Ghanaians, but for consistently, uh, the judiciary's only concern and main concern and priority is about how do we police the skirts of, of Ghanaian of female lawyers? What is the length right. of their skirts? Whether or not they address in a particular way that is sexually appealing to judges. These are matters that are, are completely appalling. And I do not understand why there's so much interest in regulation of dress standards where nowhere else is this a, a matter of concern of how we administer justice. Mm. But again, it, it's, 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 it's we are so The Chief so Justice what you, what says, to aid in the implementation of the proper administration of justice, they must dress well. 
don't you? I mean, in, in what, you must dress well to be in, able to in, in administer what justice properly. Again, when he says when he says dress well, it can get lost in translation for a lot of people. What they mean is the gown, the wig, and all of that. Not like in a, you can be in a three-piece suit or you can be in a, uh, in a cloth, and that's not dressing well as far as the court is concerned. Mm. You have to look in a particular way that they have legislated down to what socks you can wear for your shoe. This is, this is completely absurd, to be honest. But then again, uh, this, is, this is Umofia. You can expect everything. This is where? Umofia. <laughs> 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 you never cease to crack me up, Oliver. All right, so the, the second matter I really want to get into with you before we start looking at the papers has to do with the latest Corruption Perception Index, the Ghana Integrity Initiative, um, uh, which is the local chapter of Transparency International. Now, dated today, that release paints quite a picture. Basically, 180 countries, and um, where we are, it appears with our score of 43, we are not making too much progress. So... We scored 43 out of a possible clean score of 100, and we are ranked 73rd in the world out of 180 countries. Someone would say, that's, that's pretty good. But let's look at the dynamics. You would notice that we've actually stagnated. In the last two years, we've scored 43. Our best score came in 2014 when we scored 48. Since 2012 till now, we've been in the 40s. We've never hit 50, which is supposed to be the average that any country that is striving to deal with the issues of corruption, democracy, human rights would be aspiring to. And in fact, we've sat down for countries like Seychelles uh, to take top spot. They scored 70, and they are the regional uh, champions. There are many other countries, and we placed ninth. What do you make of this whole corruption perception index? Even some people say, doesn't really point to it. You can't put your finger on it. This is just a perception. What do you think? I mean, I think even if you come to the finger on something, there are still various different countries where persons perceive their systems to be more just. People perceive their system to be dealing with corruption better. Mm. Why is that? How is that possible for those countries where there's, there's institutional over, uh, uh, distrust of governments across the world? It's not only peculiar to Ghana. But for some reason, in that institutional distrust, there are certain countries where citizens are able to look at their governments and say, as far as it comes to corruption, I think we are, you know, 70, 80 percent. I don't, there, there has to be a difference there. Now, as far as we are stagnating, um, you know, I, I, I am unable to point to anything within the past 10 years that makes me convinced that we've taken a step that deals with corruption in a, you know, in a much more robust way. Right. I, I'm unable to point to anything. You know, it is, and the only thing that has happened in the past, yeah, again, in the past decade, was that we created the office of the special prosecutor. But creation of offices is much like passage of laws. Even before the office of the prosecutor, we had about six agencies dealing with corruption. And so the, if the way we think of the way in which we can cheat our way out of the system and create a sense of doing better around corruption, is that we create a further bureaucracy, knowing that there are so many other institutions that exist. That there's, that obviously, the citizens are not going to feel it. Citizens are going to look at it and return back the verdict and say that, listen, you, do, you can do all these gymnastics, but the reality is that we know that Ghana is essentially very, very corrupt. Uh, and corruption can go in so many ways. It's not only financial. Let me give you an example. Uh, last year, uh, myself and a couple of others filed a police complaint regarding the funeral of Sir John, where high-level officials in this country participated in you know, the flautage of COVID-19 rules. Same conduct, I mean, even on a minuscule level, that is going to lead, probably lead to the impeachment of Boris Johnson. And we filed this police complaint. And I had a number of you know, media interviews where people were asking me, is it realistic to expect that the police would do something about all these high-level officials? And I, was, and I was saying to myself, in what world, in a democracy, where we promise equality before the law, with a question as to whether or not this is realistic for the police to take action, be even on the table. But, but, but that, was, that, that, was before, that was before we had a certain Dr. Kufu Dampare as IGP. Wouldn't you say that things have changed somewhat? Institutionally, institutionally, it cannot depend on one individual being appointed to give a sense of right. maybe the police would act different. But yesterday, we did a follow-up on that police complaint. 
A police complaint that the police signed for. They said they have lost, they have lost the complaint. They had lost it. Yes. Now, if we live in a country where we send a petition to the presidency for the removal of the EC chair, and it comes back to us that pages from that petition are missing, whole police complaint documents are missing. We've been in this country where cocaine, as evidence, has been missing. Mm. These co contribute to perceptions of corruption. Right. So it's not just financial, but how we administer justice itself lends to this idea that there are persons who are committed to corrupting the processes that make our are intended to make our democracy better. So that's I, 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 the verdict is completely spot on. Perhaps I mean I suppose a lot of a lot more people will be surprised that we even placed, you know, what we placed. But the truth is, we haven't done anything that shows a commitment to dealing with the root problem. Right. Uh, uh, very quickly on this, what do you think we ought to be doing to better our CPI? Uh, Transparency International proposes. Let me see. Is it? Um, five things we ought to be doing. But I'd like to find out from you, what, what do you think we should be doing to change our story? Maybe to even hit at least the average of 50. What do you think Ghana should be doing? So in, in, in general terms, I, because I think that the Ghana Integrity, Integrity Initiative is overly focused on financial, the financial aspects of corruption, mm. I think questions of integrity generally come, come down to the enforcement of law. Right. You know, it, it, and, and I think that's one of the things which we have talked about consistently, that this belief that citizens ought to reform themselves to some high level of degree before things are, are, are well doesn't quite make sense. Right. People ought to have the fear of the law that even when, you, you know, nobody is watching, perhaps the long arm of the law is going to get me. Because if not, there's no way in a country of 30 million people where about... 90% of them have no basic fear that any repercussions are going to happen to them if they break the law. People, it, it will overwhelm our, our enforcement capacity. So there has to be some sense of, we have done the enforcement of the law so well that culturally it becomes ingrained in us that if I do fall far of the law, the law is going to get you. In fact, in 80% of the time, the law doesn't get you, but it's the perception that the law would get me that the long arm of the law would get me if I proposed to sell a dilapidated building in Takrade for $7.5 million to, GM, to GMPC. These things, we must have a certain fear of it. If not, we're always going to be back in this, in this situation. Right. And just to wrap, uh, so the Transparency International also shares this. They are saying that what needs to be done, uh, we need to enhance institutional checks on power, uh, empower citizens to hold power to account, sanction the corrupt to serve as a deterrent, improve transparency and accountability in political party and campaign financing, crucial, and promote efficient public service delivery and anti-corruption through digitization. That is what they propose. Let's take a quick look at the daily graphic now. And I'm going to focus on the most crucial matters so we can get into them, Oliver. A Piazza tragedy. Company that hauled explosives closed down. There's also Parliament resumes today, E-Levy top on agenda, and Ghana gas triples uh, production. There's also the story about 10 dying in the Savelugu Walewale highway accident, and six-member car snatching gang busted in Tamale. But uh, your quick take, very quick one on the Apiate incident, if you can do that in 30 seconds, so that we move to uh, Parliament's resumption today and the whole bit about the E-Levy. Your quick take from where you stand on the Apiate tragedy. I think it's a, it's, it's, it's a completely sad situation that has happened. Uh, for me, it's again a reflection of some, you know, institutional disregard for Ghanaian lives in general. We've already seen a lot of misinformation being put out there by the Ghana Police Service. Uh, disappoint, I'm a bit disappointed that, you know, uh, cooler heads were not made to prevail and actual facts being investigated before they put in information out. But one of the appeal I've made to the legal community, and I'm speaking particularly to the legal community here, is that I'm hoping that five to 10 lawyers come together and form and try to get a class action going to, to, to seek some corporate responsibility uh, for the actors involved. Uh, in other jurisdictions, lawyers are given to grant courses of public in, in the public interest. And it's very difficult in a space where so many people in this community will not be able to afford any sense of justice. I think this is where the Ghana Bar Association should be mobilizing resources to do it. Unfortunately, it has become moribund and, and I'm really trusting that certain in legal persons will be able to provide some support to them. That's what is most important to me.
Right. So on the bit about the e-levy, uh, today Parliament resumes. Hopefully they are not going to be boxing over the e-levy, but we're back to that issue. And uh, we've heard from different people saying different things. The minority has, has stated categorically that it's not going to support this. It's made it very clear. Uh, the majority is saying, the majority caucus uh, is saying that it will pass no matter what. In fact, the majority leader says it's already been approved. So what are people, you know, making noise uh, about? We've heard from the CPP's chair, Nanakos from Poma, who says, well, an e-levy, this kind of levy, it's nothing new. And she thinks it's already happening because the telcos are charging 1% when you make these transactions, uh, at least. So it's nothing new. It's just the 1.75% that she feels is too much. The, the threshold is too high. Uh, what do you think about this? And, and ahead of today's sitting in Parliament, what are you, what are you expecting to see? Um, you know, since the country, we, we, we protested the first time uh, right. this, this came to light. We were in Parliament protesting this. And first of all, I, I think that there's a confusion um, that the CPP um, member talked about. There's a confusion between service charge and a tax. A service charge is a provision of services by telecos for the mobile money services or mobile money transactions where they're entitled to charge something for, for the service used. Right. This is different from the government coming in and, and saying that any money that is in your wallet, we are taking it. But secondly, I, I, am, I, I am suspicious about the, even the constitutionality of, of, the, of the proposed levy because it is not taxing your income. It is simply going into your wallet and taking your money. Every time you move your money from your, the right side of your pocket to the left side of your pocket. And I think that I don't know how that passes the constitutional tax of, of compulsory acquisition of property. Uh, it's a matter of me interested, quite interested in testing in the court. And I do so with a lot of, a bit of hesitation because everybody I've spoken to says that we completely understand the argument and we think that is an excellent argument. We are not sure whether or not the Supreme Court will be inclined to, to accept the argument, obviously for historical reasons. Uh, going into parliament today, I think the conversation has to be broader than the majority and the minority. Uh, this is the NDC and the MPP. What is the overwhelming majority of Ghanaians saying? Now, I've seen that the, the government is proposing to go on town hall meetings across the country and speaking to Ghanaians and explaining the purpose of the tax. But conversations like this and consultations has to be two-way streets. You have to go in there expecting that the person will have a voice rather than Yes, we hear you. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Hi, Hitler. It has to be more than that, right? People are going to express dissenting views. And how do you incorporate that and propose to take that on board while you're actively passing, the, trying to pass it in, 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 in Parliament and even claiming that it's already been approved? So what you're doing that is, is explaining to them why you've taken the measure rather than, in fact, consulting them as to whether or not this measure is appropriate and even, and if so, even legal. Um... I, I don't, to be honest, I mean, I've seen the NDC flip-flop on this matter for, for on a number of times. I've seen the minority leader claim at certain instances that, yeah, we are, we are inclined to quantum reduction. Uh, then they come back and reverse course. The history hasn't been too good in terms of how the minority is able to hold up against them. But I think one of the things that is important, that at some point in this country, with all the things we complain about, about people being shy of participating in our democracy, is that 100,000 people came out onto the streets in Accra to protest VAT. Over 500,000 people in Kumasi to protest the VAT. Persons have to show their disinterest and disregard and why they do not want this tax. And I think that even the, the Rawlings administration, which we accused of, well, the same dictatorial tendencies that we continue to see now, uh, listened to the, the voices of the people and withdrew that that tax measure for at least three years before the conversation was reintroduced at some point. And so I, my real appeal then is to the people of Ghana that the conversation really is not about the majority and the minority, right. but it's about us who has been, who, as some people have called this levy, a tutubotum levy, that our pockets are, they're after our pockets. Mm. And this is something that we must then, you know, do something much more robust in, in, in showing our position to it. Right. Uh, there's also the bit about, uh, and of course, uh, that will also play out in Parliament. You know, that committee was set up, uh, the, the legal uh, committee of Parliament, to look at the LGBTQI bill. That's something else that people are looking uh, forward uh, to. Uh, but let's quickly go to the Ghanaian Times newspaper now. Two quack doctors busted over fraud, illegal abortion. There is a PF 
AG, PFAC, pushes for implementation of benchmark discount policy reversal. Five car snatches arrested in Tamale and Kusasi's Mampusi's conflict flares up renewed clashes in Boku. Have you followed the Boku situation, uh, Oliver, and the latest shooting gunning down of a police officer and, and quite a number of people, a few of them losing their lives? It appears we are not properly addressing this chieftaincy turf war. Your take? I, I've, I've followed the, the, the issue a bit, and I must give my condolences to the family of the police uh, uh, officer who, who's, who's lost her life. Mm. Uh, I think it's really sad. One of the things that I've been surprised about is the lack of coverage of the Boku situation in the media generally. I'm not seeing reporters on the ground. In fact, I've gone through some of the comment sections announcing the death of the policewoman, and I saw so many residents of the area talk about why is the media not reporting the deaths on their side and the things that are happening on a day-to-day in their lives and the only time they give coverage to anything is an incident like this that blows the situation out of proportion but in fact the abuses of citizens rights in there is not being reported and i don't know anything about it or the accuracy of these claims but it'll be really interesting I, i'm really surprised that i'm not getting we're not getting as much on the ground and you know 24-hour coverage of the situation and the volatility of the situation as as it merits the national attention mm. and also whether or not there are excesses that our security forces, which are prone to excesses, are committed on the ground. And I think this is a conversation that we need to have holistically and honestly if we want that problem solved. To be honest, I have seen some of those messages on social media as well, people saying that the media is not doing enough. Here we are doing our best, uh, you know, correspondence and all of that to paint the picture. But I do agree with you. I've seen some of those on social media. And I believe all of these issues deserve, you know, equal attention, if not more. The final newspaper, Fair Wages, urges cooler heads over ongoing strike by worker unions. Uh, Tekwe said Tekwe blames um, market uncertainties on e-levy benchmark values. Deadlock. And those are the major stories there. Of course, Malcolm is also, uh, has been donating to, to the Apiate uh, victims' families. Let's do the daily guide now. Police one, police woman, uh, three others killed in Boku clashes. Uh, and that is uh, Constable Regina Didi Anganu. Uh, the one I was just talking about. And then uh, Apiate tragedy. I didn't cause explosion. That's according to the tricycle rider who says he was hit. He also landed where he did. The, the vehicle ran into him and, and all of that. And there's fiscal deficit widening. That's according to Seth uh, Tekwe. Canada MP, Canada in quote, uh, goes to Supreme Court again. The story is on page uh, three. And I'm talking about James. Uh, I'm, this is actually the opposition NDC's member of parliament for Asin North, James Jeche uh, Kwesen. Uh, so that story in there as uh, well. Let's look at uh, the BNFT. And it says, benchmark policy puts 100,000 jobs at risk in rice industry, farmers uh, warn. And the story uh, says the Peasant Farmers Association of uh, Ghana that is, uh, the General Agricultural Workers Union and the Rice Millers Association of Ghana have expressed disappointment in the government's decision to suspend implementing reversal of the benchmark policy discount, uh, benchmark value discount policy. They cautioned that an estimated 100,000 persons who are directly engaged in the rice value chain activities stand the risk of losing their livelihoods if the benchmark discount policy reversal is not implemented as planned. So it's pretty interesting, isn't it, Oliver? We keep going back and forth on this matter. Uh, there are some, Guta, together with others, have said this is inimical to our import activities, to our service to Ghanaians. Uh, those in Abasuakai, Konkompe, and all of those places are complaining. AGI on the other end saying this is the way to go. Today we are hearing uh, from these institutions, these groupings, that the benchmark policy puts 100,000 jobs at risk in the rice industry. How do you think we can bring some finality to this issue? Um, I, you know, and in in before the government came into place, one of the things that I talked about was that taxation would not be just a revenue sourcing, a revenue raising measure, but that they would have a, an intrinsic policy purpose behind it, which is in terms of moving Ghana towards a less dependency on imports and towards more production. Um, unfortunately, the vast majority of things we consume in Ghana are still very much imported. And so our reliance on foreign imports has made this quite a, you know, a, a bigger issue that puts the economy at risk in some regard. But, but, but is it necessarily, and I, I agree with you, the rice importers, the local ones are saying, 
look, this is going to cost us, you know, in different ways. But is it necessarily the way to go? Is that the solution? Uh, making the import caps higher so that maybe people who are importing are forced to pay more, they sell at higher rates, and then our local industry can also grow. Is that necessarily the way to go? I mean, I, I think that... I think that there's a level of measure in this that I agree with, which is that one of the things we haven't done quite over the period is the protection of the, of the domestic industry, mm -hmm. the local industry, in as much as we're trying to force people into entrepreneurship. Uh, recently, I don't know whether you saw the news about Freitol exiting the market, which is for a lot of us who grew up, Freitol was the, was the brand that we all were familiar with when it came to cooking oil. It shows you a re regression in ability of businesses to survive in Ghana generally. And we have to be much more mindful of the extent to which we must go. And we must make no apologies to the extent we should go in, in trying to protect domestic industry. But when I say this, I mean that it, it doesn't stop at just raising how much we, 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 we premium we put on imports, but also what we are doing to, to, to help local industry sustain. If not, there are going to be increased rise in, 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 in the prices of, of goods we consume. And then we're going to entrench poverty. We have to make sure that the, the capacity that we have built, we have built capacity for the local industry to be able to, to come in there and occupy, uh, occupy the shortage that will, it will create in the market. And I'm not quite certain as to whether or not all these deliberations have, been, have sufficiently going to this. And I say this not as a means of criticizing government again, mm. but just that we are introducing, we are reversing, the president directly we reverse. When right. you think that this is a decision that cabinet would have thought through, and have you know a robust basis for making a decision. Right. So those we go, we will come back. We go, we come back. Kind of doesn't really inspire confidence. Okay. In any event, it's coming from the finance ministry, which primary focus has been on re raising revenue for for a budgetary shortfall and also being able to pay our debt. So you think that money is leading the decision rather than really protecting the industry as we are trying to sell the policy as. Right. Two quick issues and, and we wrap the conversation. I just want your take on them together. Uh, so the first one has to do with COVID-19 vaccine cards being for sale. And it's interesting because this was even before I saw the Economy Times today. It was something mm. I've been discussing with a colleague here mm. at work mm. about the fact that people are supposedly paying for the cards, getting mm. them, but they've not taken mm. the jab. And it's a sad situation because some uh, workers of the Ghana Health Service are supposedly cashing in through the save, sale of uh, COVID-19 vaccine cards. The other one I want you to wrap on, Ghana is out of AFCON 2021, but your, your other country, Morocco, they are facing off with Malawi at 7 uh, p.m. today. Are you throwing your weight behind Morocco now? So the vaccine card up for sale and then Morocco. Let's do this. I, I remember I had a conversation with, uh, with, with, with a friend of mine in Nigeria about this idea of the vaccine mandate. Now, I'm fully vaccinated, but I do not support a vaccine mandate. I think it goes against people's liberties to be forced into that situation. And she said to me, well, you we can go ahead and do it, but I'll tell you what happened in Nigeria. You are, what you're going to be demanding is proof of vaccination, right? Okay. Proof of vaccination everybody can get. People, would, people are just literally just going to buy, going to buy it. It's going to create a sub-economy of corruption. Mm. And, you know, we haven't even gotten there. We're already seeing this happen. Because you cannot treat vaccine hesitancy by forcing it down people's throats. You have to have an incentive framework for people to get vaccinated uh, so that we can reach herd immunity, if that's even possible now. And so I'm not surprised that we're already seeing that sub economy develop. We, we are not anticipating, you know, the, 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 the tendency in the system for people to, you know, profit, to profit even in, in the terms of health, public health crisis. Mm. Uh, and, and that also feeds into the corruption perception, doesn't it? But, but let's go on. Let's go on. Yes. On the yes, issue of Morocco. On the issue of Morocco. Yes, I think I have to go, come back and find Solis in, in Morocco now. I would have loved to do it with Nigeria. Unfortunately, they organized a Twitter space where they laughed at Ghana forever. <laughs> uh, when, when we lost. And, and, we, and, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that Gary also returned the favor and that we did fame to them when they lost. But I, you know, I actually I'm, I, I'm, I'm more disappointed that we drew Nigeria in the World Cup mm. uh, qualifier. Uh, it just means that both countries are not going to, one of the two countries is not going to be at the World Cup. And that's really, really sad to me. Um, but yeah, it's, I think the, the, the proudest moment of the AFCON has been Comoros, Comoros Island. They played, they've been one of the revelations of the tournament. They yeah. played fantastically against Cameroon, despite the, the difficulties imposed by COVID-19. And I think this Afcon has generally been a joy to watch, and and I'm looking for 
other teams, even like Gambia, you know. Yeah, and, and it's, it's Gambia really beating Guinea. Gambia actually beats Guinea. They are also debutants. And the Comoros lost to Cameroon by uh, one goal to two, but at least yeah. they, they dignified. They did a good show. Right? Oliver, thank you so much. Thank you for joining us this Tuesday morning. Thank you. I appreciate it. Great. And that is how we wrap it up uh, this morning when it comes to uh, the news uh, review. It's been pretty uh, revealing. Uh, it just comes to mind how the Nigerians were blaming their president, Buhari, for the call to the team and how supposedly it jinxed uh, the team. Interesting times. Up next, though, we have a lot more sporting action for you. Do stay.